Alexei Sultanov, at this moment you live in Texas in the United States. How did you find your way there? Well, the thing is that uh, in 89 the Van Klaubring competition happened in that town and I was lucky enough to win. And the thing is that also I haven't spoken one word of English and and after the winning of that competition there was a lot of work ahead in the States. And uh, all the competitors during the competition, they lived with host families. And uh, I kept nice relationships with my host family and they just showed me how to live in a different... To me, it was a different planet because I never left Soviet Union before. I was... I went to like one or two recitals in Germany and that's about it. So, and uh, they showed me how to speak a little English and how to take care of your life in the States. and. Um, and it's a good idea to settle in the town that you have few friends in, in the new country. But actually, I also live in Moscow and for both, both places, right next door. So is it half and half? Something like that. How many concerts do you have per year? Well, sometimes it's uh, about 15 or 20, sometimes it's about 70 or 80. And of course, I, have to, I get to choose my schedules and everything. But also, uh, it allows me to work one year more by myself and make recordings. And the second year, it's time to go and perform. So, and uh, I think any musicians, any musician should have a lot of uh, free time to to themselves because <clears throat> it's very important uh, not to burn kind of your abilities out. Uh, making 100 performances a year, every year, and I think uh, should be enough rest, enough fun, and sometimes a little bit of practice. <laughs> How much do you practice daily? Daily, um, <clears throat> if I'm not on the airplane somewhere, um, usually it's about uh, three or four hours. But uh, there, are, when I'm on the road, there are uh, sometimes problems with uh, possibilities for practice. Once. Uh, Sometimes uh, you have to go 10 or 15 days without practice because the uh, circumstances are not allowing you to do so because you have to be in the sky all the time and then come down, play a performance, and then go back up there. And the thing is that uh, sometimes you experience uh, things like you play a recital or performance after like half a month not practicing at all. This is it can be very scary, but you you know any musician should be prepared for that kind of thing. I don't know how, it's just, there is no preparation, you don't practice, <laughs> it's just, I think it's kind of in your, you have to have it in your character, or sort of a, think about confidence and, and a very big love for the music that you play. So it doesn't really matter practice you or not, it's just to play and the audience is listening and that's about all you need. And when you have organized free time for yourself, what do you do? Well, there is not much of it, <laughs> but, uh, well, I listen to all kinds of music. I uh, like, of course, classical music and everything, but also I listen to jazz, jazz fusion. I compose a little jazz rock myself, and uh, we recently played with a uh, great musician, George Duke. Uh, he is a very uh, excellent uh, Jazz, jazz man and composer and arranger and uh, we had a lot of fun jamming, jam sessioning together. And also I, as soon as I'm in Europe someplace, I got a little time to run uh, around to the museums and to, to see maybe an opera if I'm in Austria or in Italy. And uh, I like uh, reading also, I like uh, movies, European and American pr productions. And uh, I have written a couple of scripts myself, also a little. And uh, also I do some sports. What kind of? It's uh, martial arts, it's Taekwondo. And I just recently received this third uh, down, third grade black belt. So I'm kind of celebrating <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> and how much do you have time for Taekwondo? Well, when I stay home, it's, uh, you, you should do it like at least three hours every day in order to keep yourself uh, perfectly stretched and, and uh, you know, and to f uh, fix all the positions. and it's, it's a lot of work, it's just like any art. 
that's why I don't I don't want to call it like sport or fight it's not really it's much uh, above that it's uh, it's more like an art really today you play the second piano concerto of Prokofiev uh, how often you are asked to perform it uh, lately is there uh, there are many demands but uh, before the thing is that uh, this concerto has got certain I would say Russian tra traditions of playing and it's usually not very exciting traditions they are wonderful and everything else but and uh, but to me it's absolutely there is a story about this concerto of course that Prokofiev had a very dear friend Shmitkov and uh, as sometime apparently he receives a message that <laughs> the minute you are reading this message I'm committing suicide what was the reason nobody knows but the thing is that after that Prokofiev wrote that piece and it uh, contains four movements and first movement is a tremendous drama of a lost uh, close person of a lost friend and because they were friends for a very long time and very dearest friends and then uh, its first movement contains very dramatic uh, and uh, <coughs> some kind of uh, tragic cries and also illustrates uh, the madness of a person just about to who is just about to commit suicide and um, of course at the end of the cadence it's clear <laughs> that it's it, the, something is going insane and out of control and it's just uh, it just happens the second moment is some kind of a run away from the death uh, and uh, from the tragedy but apparently it uh, it only succeeds from going to this life to some other life which is uh, on one hand in this case of this concerto quite it's on one hand it's interesting world but on another has uh, on another hand it's a very terrifying world it's uh, some kind of uh, hell and that shows all these characters all these evil spirits and sometimes the evil spirits can look very beautiful and the thing is that this all these dances all this singing all this uh, uh, you know, horsemen's who are, you know, dead all a long time ago. They are the middle part of this thir third movement. There are a lot of like Middle Ages kind of uh, knights in armor and very old style, and of course some romantic things in there. And the fourth movement is sort of a. It's. A, how it shows how global the tragedy can be because it's just one example and anybody can have this situation at any time so it's very unpredictable and of course the middle part of the final movement is well i don't know some people i recently heard <laughs> they call it a pioneer song and i don't see any pioneer song in there uh, to me it's uh, it's more sort of a lullaby which is uh, as which should you know that the people sing with tears in their eyes and because it's a lullaby for the dead and the thing is that is this lullaby starts very uh, softly and very and single voice and then another voice picks it up and then finally the whole choir the whole universe is singing that and and of course the ending is very dramatic that uh, it's some situations shows you in some situation you can't ex ex escape any tragedies and everything else of course it's uh, only my it, it's a little bit of my theory about this concerto because you can have, you can build uh, millions of uh, theories this is why this concerto is so really great because you can find anybody can find very personal things in that concerto